You know, for many years, the existence of dinosaur fossils was thought to be a problem for creationists and for the biblical account of creation. Hi, my name is Eric, and what you're about to see is a powerful seminar that combines the last 30 years of research done by Dr. Hoven. It's in a field called cryptozoology, which is the study of hidden animals. The seminar is titled Dinosaurs and the Bible. Welcome to our third uh, videotape, our session on dinosaurs and the Bible. And we'll just refresh for the folks that haven't been here yet. This is not my wife. That's just a picture of her. We live in Pensacola, Florida. We have three kids, all married, and the dog died. I made it. I'm home free. <laughs> it's wonderful. And all three of my kids work for me, and two grandkids, and more coming all the time. This fellow in National Pornographic, uh, Geographic, I mean, says, <clears throat> no human being has ever seen a live dinosaur. Well now, hold on just a minute. Does he know that or does he think that? He thinks that. There's no way anybody can know that unless they talk to everybody that ever lived. Did he talk to you before he wrote that? Did he talk to Adam and Eve before he wrote that? I doubt it. He says nobody's ever seen. Well, he might believe that, but that's not part of science, folks. The Bible says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the Bible says pretty clearly in Exodus 20, in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. What do you suppose he meant by that? He wrote that on a rock with his finger. That's part of the Ten Commandments. It looks to me like he's trying to tell us that he made it all in six days, which means Adam must have seen dinosaurs. The Bible says there was no death till Adam sinned. Your textbook says dinosaurs died before man got here. Somebody is seriously wrong. And we're going to discuss today who it is. In the last session, we talked about how what the Garden of Eden was like. The Bible says when God made the world, He said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. There used to be a layer of water above the atmosphere. Some people think it was ice. I don't know if it's solid liquid or gas. I don't know. Water comes in three flavors. But somehow there was water up there. How it was up there, I don't know. The Bible says it was, and I believe that. I think there are some reasonable theories of how it might have been up there. It could have been ice suspended by the magnetic field of the earth. That's one theory. But the Bible says there was water above the firmament. Also, the Bible says most of the water that's now in the oceans used to be under the crust of the earth. If you read Psalm 24, it says, The earth is the Lord's. He founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Psalm 136, He stretched out the earth above the waters. Most of the water that's now on the surface, oceans, used to be in the crust. Big subterranean water chambers. I think when Adam and Eve were here, the world was mostly land and a small percentage of water. Today, it's 70% water and mostly land. And even that land that we have is only 3% habitable for mankind. 3% of the world's surface is habitable for mankind. Most of it's ice caps, deserts, under, underwater. God designed it to be inhabited. What we see today is a junkyard compared to what Adam and Eve saw. So there was water under the crust of the earth. That water that's under, that used to be under the crust came shooting to the surface when the fountains of the deep broke open. So from the creation up until the flood, things were very different. During that time, everything lived over 900 years. You could learn a lot in 900 years. Did you know that Adam spoke every language in the world? Well, there was only one, but he spoke it, okay? Now, <laughs> reptiles never stop growing. It's just a simple biological fact. Reptiles grow all their life. People stop growing. When you're 16 or 18, you're going to quit growing, at least uh, vertically. Some go horizontally afterwards, but reptiles never stop growing. Now, what would happen to a reptile if you put him in the Garden of Eden and let him live to be 900 years old? You'd have a big lizard. A really big lizard. Dinosaurs were giant reptiles that lived with Adam and Eve before the flood. They did not live millions of years ago. They were pre-flood, not prehistoric. So if this is all true, did Noah take dinosaurs on the ark? They asked Billy Graham, were there dinosaurs on Noah's ark? 
He said, no, apparently not. Noah's Ark did not include dinosaurs because they were extinct before man got here. Oh, Billy, now you got death before sin. I love Billy Graham, praise God, for the good he's done, but folks, he's wrong about that one. Dinosaurs on the ark. Man, hope, hope he kept the woodpeckers in a steel cage of some kind. <laughs> some people say, <clears throat> what do you mean dinosaurs on the ark? They're kind of big, aren't they? Well, the big ones were big, but the little ones were little. <laughs> and Noah was 600 years old when he built that boat. I just bet he was smart enough to figure out you don't have to bring the biggest ones you can find. Bring two babies. Mm -hmm. Just be sure to get a pink one and a blue one. That'll be important later. Uh, <laughs> there's all kinds of reasons for bringing babies on the ark. You bring babies because they're smaller. Oh, duh. You know, the biggest dinosaur egg ever found is smaller than a football. You bring babies because they weigh less. They eat less. They sleep a lot more. They're tougher. You know, kids fall down and bounce and get up and keep running. Adults fall down and break or lay there for a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Plus, you bring babies because after the flood, they're going to live longer to produce more offspring, and that's why you're bringing them. So it makes common sense to bring babies. Why would you bring big elephants on the ark? Why bring big giraffes? Bring babies. Hello? Plus, you only had to bring two of every sort, not two of every single variety, just two of the basic kinds of animals. He said in Genesis 7, bring them after their kind, after their kind, after their kind, after their kind. I mean, the Bible's pretty clear. There was the basic kinds of animals, and only those in whose nostrils was the breath of life and only those on dry land. Noah did not have to bring any fish on the ark. They had plenty of water outside. <laughs> he also didn't have to bring any bugs on the ark because bugs don't have nostrils. They breathe through their skin, through spiracles. Hey, bugs can survive a flood just fine on floating log mats or floating dead carcasses or something or burrow in the mud. Go any place where there's been a flood. After the water runs off, walk out into the mud and tell me the first thing you notice. Bugs bite a gazillions, right? Noah brought two of the basic kinds of animals on the ark. Noah probably never saw a chihuahua in his life. <laughs> he just brought generic dogs, like our dog, Nicky. We had Nicky for 12 years before we even knew what kind he was. <laughs> a friend of mine came to my house one day and said, Oh, hey, Brother Hovind, you got a canardly. I said, A what? He said, Your dog, that's a canardly. I said, Really? He said, Yeah, look at it. You can already tell what kind of dog it is. <laughs> I mean, if you have a full-blooded canardly at home, there we go. <laughs> so just generic animals. This Mexican textbook says the horse and the zebra had a common ancestor. I agree. And it looked like a horse. Four-wheel drive, genuine leather upholstery, all the standard equipment. You know, it was a horse kind of animal. So the basic kinds that were on the ark, not every species. Skeptics will say, how did he fit those millions of animals on that little bitty boat? Well, now, hold on just a minute. He only brought the land animals. Okay? Bring those with nostrils, no bugs. Bring babies, that's common sense. Bring two of each kind, not every single species or variety. Plus, uh, how many were there? Many experts will tell you there are about 8,000 basic kinds of animals in the world. Just basic kinds of animals. Now, I talk pretty fast. I can get going 300 words a minute when I get excited. But did you know if you just talk 60 words per minute, you can name all 8,000 animals in a little over two hours. Some people say, Adam couldn't name all the animals in one day. Are you kidding? You can name them in about an hour. Dog kind, cat kind, hippo kind, giraffe kind, elephant kind. <laughs> Plus, Adam had an IQ of who knows what. I mean, he came pre-programmed straight from the hand of God. He could walk, talk, name the animals, and get married all first day. <laughs> really smart fella, okay? Plus, uh, how big was the ark? The atheist will say, he couldn't put those animals on the ark. And I say, really, how many were there? They say, we don't know. Oh, well, how big was the ark? They'll say, well, we don't know. All we know is he couldn't do it. <laughs> oh, I see. Is that the way this works? Yeah. Well, beats what they believe. They believe 18 or 20 billion years ago, nothing exploded in the Big Bang and made everything. Mm -hmm. And then 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down and a rocky surface was created. Yes, boys and girls, the planet earth cooled and a rocky surface was created. This is what the textbooks teach. And as earth formed, it was like the moon it was hot and there were large pools of bubbling lava. But slowly, rocks absorbed the oxygen. Notice this textbook says, the percentage of oxygen was zero, but the rocks absorbed it. <laughs> I wondered about that when I said, it's a college textbook. Yeah, there was nothing there, but they absorbed it all right. Yeah. 
So the rocks absorbed the oxygen and then it began to rain on the rocks. Oh man, oceans formed as it rained for millions of years. Millions of years of torrential rains created great oceans. And swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. Boy, I guess it is. It's totally stopped. Doesn't even happen. That's how slow it is. This book says the first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. So their theory says 20 billion years ago, Big Bang, 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down. It rained on the rocks for millions of years, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive 3 billion years ago. And that first life form found somebody to marry. Now there's a good trick. <laughs> and something to eat, of course, and slowly evolved into everything we see today. So great, 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 great grandpa was soup. They asked me to speak at this college in Boston one time. They said, you can speak to our students if our professors can ask you any questions they want, because we'd like to show the students how dumb you Christians really are. I said, I would be honored to come for that. <laughs> so I got, I got, <laughs> I got, I got there and there were six professors and all their students in the room. I felt like Daniel in the lion's den, you know. I said, folks, I got my charts out here, and I said, I believe the Bible. The Bible says God made everything 6,000 years ago, 4,400 years ago, there was a big flood, you know, destroyed the world. Noah saved two of each kind, not every species, just the basic kinds on the ark. Now, since then, there's been a lot, whole lot of varieties produced, you know, big dogs, little dogs, curly hair, straight hair, no question, but just basic kinds on the ark. And then I told them what they believe, because most of them don't know what they believe. You got to tell them. You guys believe 20 billion years ago, Big Bang, 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down, it rained on the rocks for millions of years, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive 3 billion years ago. One professor was getting kind of upset about that time. He said, Hovind, do you realize there are hundreds of varieties of dogs in the world? I said, yes, sir, there's a bunch. He said, do you mean to tell me that all those dogs came from only two dogs on Noah's Ark? You expect me to believe that? I said, sir, would you look at what you're teaching your students? You're teaching your students that all the dogs in the world came from a rock. <laughs> he didn't have any more questions after that. I was in a debate one time, and afterwards this lady came up to me and she said, she was obviously upset. She said, tonight, you said that we believe we come from a rock. We do not believe that. I said, ma'am, just calm down. You're about to blow a gasket, you know. I said, ma'am, do you believe in evolution? She said, yes, I do. I'm a professor here at the university. I said, okay, then tell me, where did we come from? She said, we came from a macromolecule. I said, and where did that come from? She said, from the oceans, from the prebiotic soup. I said, where did that come from? She said, well, it rained on the rocks for millions of years. <laughs> it was so cool. You could see it was slowly dawning on her. You know, I do believe I come from a rock, don't I? <laughs> yes, ma'am, you certainly do. Yeah. I found her life verse saying to a stock, Thou art my father, to a stone, thou hast brought me forth. There's grandpa. Mm -hmm. Yep. I found my daddy's life verse. Lord have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vet. <laughs> anyway, the Bible says the earth was filled with violence. Everybody was wicked. All flesh had corrupted his way. Everything was corrupt. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. The earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark. And so Noah said to his boys, Boys, go for wood. we got to build a boat. <laughs> and so they went and got all this wood, and they built this big boat. Now after the flood was over, Noah's son had a son and named him Arphaxad. Why would anybody name a kid Arphaxad? <laughs> Can't you see that kid in kindergarten? What's your name, son? Arphaxad? You know how to spell it? No. <laughs> Nobody does. <laughs> Don't you think one day, little Arfaxad's getting big enough, he's sitting on Grandpa's lap like kids do, and he looks around, he says, Hey, Grandpa, I have a question. How come we're the only people in the whole world? Uh, where is everybody? <laughs> Eventually, that thought's going to cross his mind, and Grandpa's going to tell him the story about the flood. Actually, his daddy's going to live long enough to tell that story to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They lived a long time back there, folks, right after the flood. And today there are 270 surviving flood legends. They're still telling the story about the flood in many cultures that have never heard of the Bible. You know, the Hawaiians uh, had a legend that said 
The first, after, long after the death of Kunihana, the first man, the world became a wicked, terrible place to live. There was one good man left. His name was Nu'u. He made a great canoe with a house on it and filled it with animals. The waters came up over all the earth and killed all the people. Only Nu'u and his family were saved. Interesting. One family saved in a giant canoe. That sounds kind of like the Bible story, doesn't it? The Chinese have a story called the Hiking Classic. It's one of the oldest stories in the world. It says the father of their civilization is a guy named Fu Hai. The story says Fu Hai, his wife, three sons, and three daughters escaped a great flood. After the flood, they were the only people alive on earth. And they repopulated the world. Well, now that sounds kind of like the Bible story too, doesn't it? The Tolik Indians in Mexico have a legend that says, The first world lasted 1,716 years and was destroyed by a flood that covered the highest mountains. Only one family named Cox Cox survived. 1,716 years. Well, you know, the Bible dates add up to 1656. But that's not bad for a legend 4,000 years old. I just suspect maybe even the Atlantis story is another flood legend. As far as the people on the ark were concerned, the whole world sank beneath the waves, you know. Why would there be 270 surviving flood legends today? Oh, well, I think it's because there was a flood. That's my theory. <laughs> it's not too complicated. If you look at the country of Turkey, on the far right-hand side, there's a mountain called Mount Ararat. On a Turkish map, this is called Noah on Gumshi, which means Noah's big boat. They've got signs. You drive right up to it. This way to Noah's big boat, five kilometers. The Bible says the ark rested in the seventh month. Now, that's interesting. Some of the skeptics will say, Noah, the flood lasted a year. The flood didn't last a year. Noah was in the ark for a year. But parts of the ground probably only underwater for a few weeks or a few months, just long enough to drown everybody. The ark actually hit bottom in the seventh month. Now, why didn't he get out till the 13th month? Uh, we cover all that on video number six, all the reasons why he stayed in the ark. But the Bible says the ark rested in the seventh month upon the mountains, plural, mountains of Ararat. The Bible does not say the ark landed on Mount Ararat. It could have, I don't know, but it doesn't say that. There are at least four theories of what happened to Noah's ark. Some people says, say they took it apart and used the lumber for buildings. After all, when Noah got off the ark, how big were the trees outside? About this big, right? Pretty tough to build a house out of. Some people say it rotted, it fell apart, it's gone. Could be. Some people say it's still on the mountain. And they're always going over there looking for it. And they always come back and say, boy, we just almost found it. We'll try again next year. And it could be, I don't know. Other people think it's not even on the mountain, it's down in the valley. Those who think it's on the mountain go over there looking for it. And they always say, it could be here, could be here, could be here. And they're always looking for it. And I'm not against that at all. But I just am telling you, there's no absolute scientific proof that it's even on the mountain. Other folks think it's not even there. They think it's down in the valley because the chances of something landing on a mountain as the mountains are rising or the water's running off, the chances are close to zero. Try it in a bathtub. Bring something up under a floating object. It'll float off to the side. It's more likely to land in what's called a nested area between a bunch of mountains and the water can slowly drain off. Many people think that the 1960 photograph showed a boat-shaped object that could have been Noah's Ark. As they examined it, then in 1978, an earthquake lifted it up out of the ground, or the ground fell away, or whatever happened. It's now sticking up out of the ground about 10 feet or 15 feet. They think that's Noah's Ark, right there, that boat-shaped object. I've had people tell me that's not Noah's Ark, because when mud flows around an object, it makes a teardrop shape. Well, I understand that. I taught physics. I know how that works. If the front end of an airplane wing is rounded, the back end is pointed. But this one's facing backwards. There are two more teardrop shapes like that, but the round end is uphill. On this one, the pointed end is uphill. This is not a mud flow. Many folks think that's Noah's Ark. I knew Ron Wyatt. He died in 99, but he was a good friend of mine. We differed on quite a few little things, but he was a good guy. He loved the Lord. He and many other folks thought that was Noah's Ark. They did a lot of studies on that and said, yep, yeah, we think that's the Ark. They say it collapsed on itself, folded out to the side. It's with ground penetrating radar. They found what they said were deck timbers in there. They found iron rivets and bolted this thing together. They've got some in the museum south of Nashville. I've, I've held the rivets in my hand. Go to Cornersville, Tennessee. As soon as you get off the interstate, this whole abandoned gas station that they've con or converted gas station right there into the museum about Noah's Ark. The government of Turkey said, yep, that's Noah's Ark down in the valley. They built a visitor center. Now there have been some creationist organizations that say, no, it's not Noah's Ark, and we don't like you because you even say it might be. Oh, okay, <laughs> I'm sorry, you know. If I ever start working for you, I'll do what you say. But meanwhile, I'm going to tell folks I think it's a possibility that it could be Noah's Ark. The Bible says, 
the arc will be 300 cubits long. Now a cubit is elbow to fingertip. I'm 6'1", my cubit is 21 inches. The standard Hebrew cubit was 18 inches. The standard Egyptian cubit is 20.6. That boat-shaped object is 20.6 inches times 300, or 515 feet long. So that doesn't prove it's Noah's Ark, but it could be. It's in the right place, it's about the right shape, and it's about the right length. It's about two-thirds the size of the Titanic. Makes it about almost two football fields long. Pretty good-sized boat. In that region, they found 12 big rocks that weigh about 9,000 pounds apiece. These rocks have holes in the top. Apparently, that hole was to hold a rope, and this rock was held over the side of the boat. Ten or twelve, or who knows how many. They found twelve. Could have been more. That's called a drogue stone. If you hang a bunch of rocks all around the boat, the boat becomes more stable during stormy weather. It's like a whole bunch of shock absorbers to keep the boats flat, you know, keep your platform flat. If it really gets windy, they'll drag behind you, and it turns the boat perpendicular to the waves. Now you can't roll over, capsize. That's real dangerous in high seas. One atheist wrote me a letter and said, Hoven, I heard your seminar about Noah's Ark having rocks hanging all over the side. He said, you are so stupid. Don't you know if he had rocks hanging all over the boat, it would slow him down? <laughs> I wrote back and said, where was he going? <laughs> He's not trying to go anywhere. He's just trying to float. Brother. And I'm stupid, yeah. I debated a former preacher turned atheist. And he said, you can't build a boat more than 300 feet long because it'll break going over the waves. He said, they built a ship one time that had six masts, you know, a six-master, and the, you know, the tw twisted the boat so bad it leaked all the time, they finally had to give it up. Noah's Ark didn't have any masts. Hello, it's designed to float, not to sail. All right? <laughs> Probably a big barge of some kind. I don't know. He said, a boat, you know, when the waves come up, it bends and breaks in the middle. Well, a lot of boats over 300 feet long have been built out of wood and survived. The Chinese had some really big ones many years ago, out of wood. Plus, if you put a moon pool in the boat, that solves the problem. A moon pool is a hole in the floor with walls up on the inside, of course, so the boat doesn't sink. And as, the, as you go over the waves, this relieves the stress. Now the water com actually comes up inside the boat partway. A moon pool is a pretty cool idea. As the water goes up and down in that hole, it would be relieving the stress. Great place to dump your garbage, too, by the way, inside the boat, out of the rain. Thirdly, it acts like a giant piston to pump fresh air in and out of the boat every time you hit a wave. Uh, remember what he had in the basement? You might pray for a good wave once in a while. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, when the dinosaurs got off the ark, what happened to them? If the Bible story is true, as I say that it is, Noah had to have dinosaurs on the ark, so what happened to them? What made the dinosaurs go extinct? That's a question they're always asking the kids in school. There are at least 16 theories floating around the textbooks. They'll say, kids, maybe a meteor struck the Yucatan Peninsula 65 million years ago. Well, another guy from Indiana's got a cool theory. He says the dinosaurs killed themselves off with their own flatulence. <laughs> he said they couldn't stand the heat. I don't know what to do about a theory like that, but uh, what made the dinosaurs go extinct? Hey, uh, they're asking the wrong question. The question is not what made them go extinct. The question is, did they go extinct? You know, the liberals are really good at getting us to argue about the wrong topic. They're always asking me, should we teach creation in public schools? I said, that's a good question, and I will be glad to discuss it. However, there's another question we need to ask first. Should we have public schools? Yeah, let's ask that one first. I praise God for the good, godly public school teachers. My mother was a public school teacher and retired. My brother's in his 34th year teaching public school. He led me to the Lord. There are many good, godly public school teachers, okay? But folks, the, work, the books they work from, the curriculum, is corrupt. Unfixable, I think. If you, if you love your kids and you possibly can, get them out. I don't think it's fixable. Praise God for the good teachers who are going to slug it out in there, and I'm for you, and I want to help. Okay, but I don't think it's fixable. Bottom line. If you want to find out why we have a public school system... Our Tenth Amendment to the Constitution says the federal government's got no business being involved in education. But we've got a public school system as part of a bigger, long-range plan toward a new world order. That's Karl Marx's idea, Communist Manifesto Plank Number 10, free public education. We'll cover more on that on uh, 
seminar part five, and also on our college class, CSE 102. You don't want to watch that one. That's politically incorrect. Anyway, when the dinosaurs got off the ark, they faced a very hostile climate. Things had changed. Remember, before the flood, they lived over 900 years. After the flood, only 400, and then 200, and then 100. Something changed after the flood, folks. The canopy of water that used to protect them was gone. And you're not going to make it to 100, or 200 for sure. You might make it to 100, but you won't make it to 200. Not in this world. Dinosaurs had two serious problems after the flood. Number one, the climate was a lot different. They just couldn't live long enough to get big enough to reproduce in many cases. So some species probably went extinct in the first few generations. Second problem, I think, was worse. People hunted them. Back in those days, they called them dragons. They didn't call them dinosaur because the word dinosaur wasn't made up till 1841. So for most of human history, they called them dragons. Dragons are mentioned in the Bible 35 times. And as the population began to grow after the flood, the population of dragons began to go down because nobody wants to live next door to a dragon. <laughs> the same thing happened right here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. How many grizzly bears are roaming loose in the woods in this county right here? Zero, right? How many grizzly bears were roaming around Milwaukee area 500 years ago? Probably a whole bunch of them. Well, what happened? As people move in and civilize an area, the big, dino, the big creatures, or ferocious creatures, are driven off or killed off. It happens all the time. If it came on the evening news tonight that there were five grizzly bears roaming around Milwaukee, Wisconsin, do you know what would happen by 6 o'clock in the morning? Every redneck in four counties would be out there with a rifle trying to shoot them. <laughs> right? And whoever could shoot the biggest one would be a hero. They'd put his picture in the paper. Hey, Bubba shot the grizzly bear and saved the village. <laughs> that's exactly what would happen. Well, that's what happened to the dragons. Man, if you could figure out a way to kill a dragon, you'd be a hero. They'd tell stories about you around the campfire for generations to come. And there are thousands of stories of people killing dragons. They killed them off for meat. There'd be a lot of hamburger in one brachiosaurus. They killed them for medicine. It's amazing how many ancient recipes call for dragon bones to be ground up and put in with the medicine. Lots of legends tell of people killing dragons. Gilgamesh supposedly slew a dragon. A Chinese guy named Yu slew dragons that were bothering them as they tried to expand the territory and drain off the swamps and make the land of China livable again. They had to drive off the snakes and dragons. The Babylonian god Marduk is shown pictured on top of a dragon, possibly a fire-breathing dragon. You say, oh, you don't believe in fire-breathing dragons, do you? Oh, yeah. The Bible talks about a fly, fiery flying serpent. The book of Job has a whole chapter, Job 41, about Leviathan, the fire-breathing dragon. It says, out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils go a smoke. I've seen deacons do that at Southern Baptist churches. As out of a seething pot or cauldron, his breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. There really was a fire-breathing dragon. In our green series of tapes, the topical ones, we've got a whole tape out there, hour and a half, about Leviathan, the fire-breathing dragon. If you get a Catholic Bible, you find the book of Daniel has two extra chapters. Daniel 13 and 14. It's part of the apocryphal books. It shouldn't be in Scripture. It's interesting reading, but it's not part of Scripture. It says, There was a great dragon in the place, and the Babylonians worshipped him. And the king said to Daniel, Behold, thou canst not say now that this is not a living God. Adore him therefore. And Daniel said, I adore the Lord my God, for he is the living God, but that is no living God. But give me leave, it means give me permission, O king, and I will kill this dragon without sword or club. And the king said, I give thee leave. Then Daniel took pitch and fat and hair and boiled them together and made lumps and put them into the dragon's mouth, and the dragon burst asunder. What a strange story. Let me give you the Hoven translation of what's going on here. The Bible tells us Daniel was a man who understood science. He knew full well that pitch is made from tree sap and it's very sticky. They used to have whole industries in America just making pitch to use to uh, waterproof ships. They would coat them with pitch made from tree sap, particularly pine. And fat is very salty tasting and just about all animals like salty tasting things. The, the hunters put out salt licks for the deer, right, or cat, cattle have like salt licks. And hair won't digest. He mixed them all together, tossed them in. The dragon liked the taste, swallowed them, but they wouldn't digest. And these were the days before Roto-Rooter, and so he burst asunder. Mm -hmm. You figure it out.
Anyway, uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, Hussein, thinks he is Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated. The guy has a serious ego problem. He thinks he is Nebuchadnezzar brought back to life. By the way, do you ever notice George Bush always called him Saddam Hussein? There's a reason for that. I've been told, anyway, the word Saddam means prince. Saddam, spelled the same way, means horse's rear end. <laughs> but Saddam thinks he is Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated. He's got his picture in front of Nebuchadnezzar on their currency over there, their gold coins. He spent a fortune rebuilding the ancient city of Babylon. Did you know ancient Babylon has been rebuilt? They always knew where the city was. It was destroyed about 600 B.C. But when Babylon was, they, you know, just buried in the sand, forget about it, they dug it out and the sand had really preserved the bricks extremely well. The old brick walls of the ancient city of Babylon were very well preserved in the dry sand over there. And they found carvings of lions and carvings of dragons. Now, how did they know about dragons in 600 B.C.? Well, that had been almost 2,000 years since the flood. So from the flood up until, you know, Nebuchadnezzar reigned is 1,800 years. Probably most dinosaurs were gone by then. But I think a few were still around. And he had one in a cage, apparently. In 300 B.C., Alexander the Great reported his soldiers were scared by dragons when they conquered part of India. This Roman mosaic was made in the second century after Christ. It shows two long-necked dragons fighting or kissing. Boy, that would be necking, wouldn't it? Wow. Uh, anyway, how did the Romans know about dragons in the second century after Christ? St. George is famous for slaying dragons in 275 A.D. He finally got killed because he was a Christian. Beowulf slew dragons. You ought to try to read the Beowulf story in Old English. We sell the book only because it's such interesting reading. The Old English is, I think, impossible to read. That's English, folks, from 1,500 years ago. Our language has changed a little bit, okay? Probably the peak of the English language was about 400 years ago when Shakespeare and God chose to use the, make the King James and all that stuff about that time, about the peak of the English language. But the Beowulf story says Beowulf killed Grendel the dragon by pulling off one of its arms and the creature bled to death. Strange story. You know, they found a Babylonian cylinder seal showing a guy pulling the arm off a dragon. There are dragon legends from countries all over the world. Ancient pottery, like this one, probably one of the oldest pieces of pottery on planet Earth, from the eight, uh, first dynasty of Egypt, shows two long-necked dragons. Looks like dinosaurs to me. Here's another one showing two long-necked dinosaurs holding a sheep between their mouth, between their mouths. This hippo tusk was found in an ancient Egyptian tomb from the 12th century B.C. Shows an animal with a long neck and a long tail. Why would there be dragon legends from countries all over the world? Thailand has many legends of the dragon. China, of course, is famous for its dragon legends. The uh, gargoyle that you see on the corners of the buildings in Europe, you know, apparently came from the story of a gargoyle, uh, they called it a dragon, that came up out of the water in France. That's where the gargoyle legend comes from. There's a Russian medallion that shows a man killing a dragon. This Bulgarian postage stamp shows a guy killing a dragon. An Irish writer said they killed a dragon with iron nails on its tail. Well, the Stegosaurus had awful big spikes on his tail. We've got a copy of one in our museum there. There are dragon heads found on the ships that the Vikings used to sail around. Here's a Viking uh, woodcut showing a dragon swallowing a man. Taken from a book called Vikings by Tony Allen. 11th century picture. That's just 900 years ago. They were still talking about pe dragons swallowing people. The Vikings put dragon heads on their ships. Interesting. Get the book After the Flood by Bill Cooper. Excellent book about what happened to Noah's sons and how they spread out if you like the genealogy type stuff. He's really brilliant at that. But he mentions many of these ancient people talking about having to fight dragons. You get that book from our ministry or on our website, drdino.com. Siegfried, the famous Norwegian hero, slew the dragon Fafner about a thousand years ago. Marco Polo lived in China about 800 years ago, 750 years ago, and said the emperor in China was raising dragons to pull chariots in his parades. Why would he come back and tell a story like that? Well, I think it's because the emperor was raising dragons to pull chariots in his parades. That's, that's my theory of why he said that. Did you know in 1611, the old Chinese law books tell about they appointed the post of royal dragon feeder? 
Why do you need a royal dragon feeder? Mm, let me guess. Uh, to feed the dragon. Yeah, right. A city in France was renamed Nurluk to honor the man who slew the dragon. The Indians used to carve pictures on the cliffs of Grand Canyon and all the canyons out there. One of the pictures they found shows a dinosaur. Now, how did the Indians know about dinosaurs to carve their pictures on the walls of the Grand Canyon? Well, maybe they hunted dinosaurs. Hmm. In 1925, some scientists went down one of the canyons out west, just exploring that region, and here's what they wrote. The fact that some prehistoric man made a pictograph of a dinosaur on the walls of this canyon upsets completely all of our theories. Oh, you poor fella. They upset his theories. Hmm. He said, Facts are stubborn and immutable things. If theories do not square with the facts, the theories must change. The facts remain. I agree. That's the way science is supposed to work. You can have any theory you want, but if the facts don't square with your theory, throw your theory away. They would have thrown out evolution a long time ago, except they don't have a replacement theory other than, you know, maybe creation. He goes on and he says, About a year ago, a photograph of a dinosaur was shown to a scientist of national repute who was then specializing in dinosaurs. He said, It's not a dinosaur, it's impossible. Because we know dinosaurs were extinct 12 million years before man appeared on earth. I want you to notice, he said, dinosaurs went extinct 12 million years. Right? Today they tell the kids, 65 million years. I've been studying the inflation of the age of the earth. Did you know in 1770 the textbooks say the earth was 70,000 years old? Some of them do. You go to 1905 textbooks, they say the earth is 2 billion years old. In 1969, the textbooks say the earth is three and a half billion years old. Today it says 4.6 billion. Did you know the earth is getting older at the rate of 21 million years per year? <laughs> That's 40 years per minute. Mm -hmm. Aging rapidly, folks. Go to Blanding, Utah, and you can see carvings of dinosaurs on the cliffs there. Here's a painting found in Australia on a, by an aboriginal showing a native running away from a long-necked, round-bodied animal, probably a dinosaur. I can't pronounce the name of this place in Canada, Misha something or other, but it looks like somebody drew a dinosaur on the cliff up there. The Indians talked about the great animal that lived in the lake out there. This guy says nobody's ever seen one. <laughs> he doesn't know that. If nobody's ever seen one, why did they carve them on the cliffs? Hmm? Down in Ica, Peru, they've got the driest desert in the world down there. The Spanish came across there and saw white lines across the desert. Nobody could figure out what those white lines were until they got airplanes and realized these are actually giant images. One of the images shows a spider that looks really strange. One of the legs is longer, sticking out to the side like that. And for years everybody thought, well, these guys were just making up these stories. They're just, you know, it's imagination. They just discovered here recently there's a little tiny spider that lives in the desert. It's extremely rare. Most folks have never seen it, never heard of it. It's only about an eighth of an inch long, this spider. During mating season, that leg grows longer, and that's how they mate with that next spider. Then it goes back in. How, they had to have magnifying glasses to even know that. And here they are carving them huge images out in their desert. Either these guys had incredible eyesight, or they knew about how to do magnify things somehow. Long, get Dennis Swift's book on that. He's got a lot of good stuff on this images down in Nazca. But in, 17, in 1571, the Spanish came across there, and they found rocks with strange animals on them. They were carved in these rocks. They brought some back to the king of Spain and said, What are these? He said, I don't know. I've never seen an animal like that. Today they're called the Nazca burial stones. There are about 20 of these in America. We have three in our museum in Pensacola. The largest collection, I think, the second largest collection in America. Three. <clears throat> Some of them show brain surgery. Some of them show replacing artificial, putting artificial limbs on people. One of them shows what appears to be a steam engine. These are from 2,000 years ago when these things were carved on there. About 500 of the stones show dinosaurs with people. Now why would there be dinosaurs and people to carve together on these stones 2,000 years ago? Just about every known dinosaur is pictured on these things, including many unknown dinosaurs. We could spend hours talking. We'll talk more about the Ica stones on our college class uh, 102. But uh, this one shows, Dennis Swift has this one. He shows uh, circles on the side of the dinosaur. Here's one from my museum. Shows a dinosaur holding a guy by the head. Here's another one I've got in our museum. Shows a dinosaur with had his head cut off. Apparently this guy has a knife in his hand. 
cut the dinosaur's head off because the dinosaur killed his friend. That's, we think that's what the story's telling. He's taking vengeance is what the Bible says. You know, vengeance is fine, saith the Lord. Uh, something like that. I forget how it goes exactly, but that's close enough. <laughs> now, why would they put dinosaurs on these stones? And why put the circles on the side? Now, that's really interesting. You know, if you found dinosaur bones, that would not give you a clue what the skin looked like. Here's these stones from 2,000 years ago showing circles on the side. You know, they found fossilized dinosaur skin about 12 years ago, and it had uh, circle patterns on it. The fossilized dinosaur skin shows circle patterns. It looks to me like they must have seen a live one to know how to do that. This one shows a guy cutting the head off of one. Here's a guy riding a dinosaur of some kind. They found pottery in one of the uh, graves down there. It looked like a dinosaur. Clear as a bell to anybody else that could be a dinosaur on this pottery. The mummy in the grave was wrapped up in a blanket and it had dinosaurs embroidered into the blanket. <coughs> Why would they put dinosaurs on their blankets and on their pottery and carve them on cliff walls? You go to Acamburro, Mexico, and they found 56,000 ceramic figurines of dinosaurs as they dug to put in a basement at this one house. They said, wait a minute, somebody stored a cache of dinosaurs. Thousands and thousands of them. We could spend many days talking about this, but lots more on that on seminar part two of our series. We cover more on dinosaurs and Ica stones. This guy says nobody's ever seen one. I'm sorry, he does not know that. An Italian fella, 400 years ago, was out walking his cows, taking care of his cows, and a, apparently a dinosaur scared his cows, and he hit the thing on the back of the neck and broke its neck with his walking stick. They had it stuffed and mounted for a museum display, probably a Tanistrophius. Now, by the way, do you, know, do you know why so many Italians are named Tony? Years ago, they were shipping a bunch of them to America, and they stamped on their forehead, to New York. <laughs> Figured. Never mind, never mind, never mind. Okay. This... <laughs> Many people think the Sutton artifact appears to be like a pterodactyl with its wings folded against its body. Another dinosaur. The Romans came across to America long before Columbus did. One of the Roman swords found in Arizona shows a dinosaur on it. I called the guy who's got the sword. I said, uh, Tom, what do you think about this uh, sword? He said, well, it has to be fake because we know man and dinosaurs did not live at the same time. <laughs> oh, do you know that or do you think that? And kids, if you ever get taught that Columbus was the first white man across the ocean, you are mistaken. They are mistaken, okay? Brendan the Navigator came over here in 500 A.D. The Romans came back and forth. Apparently, King Solomon made his ships go back and forth across the ocean to America. There's lots of evidence of trade back and forth long before the Dark Ages shut all that stuff down, apparently. But during the recent age of sailing ships, after the Dark Ages was over, there were many reports during that 400-year span of sightings of sea monsters. Many, many legends of sea monsters exist. I have read so many stories. We can talk for hours on this. I won't, but I've read, I'm sure, 300 books just on the sea monster sightings from ancient ships' log books, stuff like that. It's incredible how many sightings of sea monsters are recorded in ancient books. Captain McKay said his crew saw a sea monster 60 feet long swim under their boat. The whaling ship Monongahela actually killed a 103-foot sea monster. They measured it. They were cutting it up. And another, another ship said, what are you guys doing? They said, we just killed a sea monster. Amazing story to read the whole story about the Monongahela. The sea monster knocked the captain out of the small boat that went out there to harpoon it. Sailors had to rescue him. He was unconscious. This thing had a huge head. They cut the thing up, put the bones in the boat. The other ship bought the oil, sea serpent oil, and went back and told the story. He said, man, the Monongahela is coming in a few months, and they're going to show you guys the bones of a sea serpent. Well, the Monongahela sailed on and was never heard from again. Apparently, it sank in a storm. So I'm sure some more sailors got laughed at for claiming they saw sea monsters. One of the guys who later rescued the folks on the Titanic was Captain Roston, Arthur Henry Roston. In 1907, he saw off the coast of Ireland as a sea monster. He sketched pictures of it. He said it was a sea serpent. Now what, notice what this author of this book says. This book is called Titanic, Triumph and Tragedy. The author says, however imaginative the young officer may have been, uh, excuse me, do you see any prejudice in that statement? In other words, he thinks he saw a sea monster, but I know better because, you know, he was there and I wasn't. <laughs> One German submarine commander said that when they sank a British ship during World War I, what appeared to be a giant sea monster came flying up out of the water, 60 feet long, four big flippers. 
There are stories of giant octopus pulling ships underwater. You say, come on, now, octopus never get that big. Oh, they get pretty big. This one washed up on the beach in Florida, St. Augustine, about a hundred years ago. The octopus was 200 feet across and weighed five tons. That's a big octopus. That's not the biggest one. A whale was killed near Seattle. Inside the whale's stomach was one arm to an octopus. All around the whale's body were 18-inch scars, circular scars, where something, either a giant octopus or squid, tried to drown the whale. See, whales love to eat octopus or squid, either one. And squid and octopus never stop growing. Now, if you're an animal that never stops growing, someday you won't have any more enemies. By the way, if you ever see a piece of puked-up octopus floating around in the ocean, be sure to grab it. It's worth a fortune. Does anybody know what they make out of puked-up octopus? Perfume. That is correct. <clears throat> that explains a few things, doesn't it, fellas? <laughs> hey, dear. You smell like a puked-up octopus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and you can sleep on the couch for a month too, honey. Mm -hmm. yeah. There are some awfully big squids out there. The Navy research vessel saw a squid wrestling with a giant whale one time in 1966. Giant squid. This one's in the Peabody Museum. A huge squid model over my head there. They said this one washed up on the beach in New Zealand. It was a baby giant squid. Full grown, it would have been 150 feet long. Some people say, now hold it, Mr. Hovind. If uh, dinosaurs are mentioned in the Bible, and if they're mentioned all through history as living with man, are they mentioned in the Bible? I said, oh yeah, they're in there. And I said, I didn't see them in there. Well, you won't see the word dinosaur because that word was made up in 1841. King James was translated in 1611. You know, figure it out. They couldn't use that word. It didn't exist yet. But dinosaurs are in there. If you read the book of Job, Job has 42 chapters. In the first two chapters, it tells us Job was a perfect man. He feared God and hated evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. And he had thousands of sheep and camels and oxen and asses. The guy was rich. And one day the messenger came and said, Job, I got some bad news. The oxen and asses got stolen and your servants were killed. Oh, and Job, by the way, the sheep all burned up. Thousands and thousands of sheep all burned. Probably lightning or something, who knows. And Job, your camels got stolen. And by the way, Job, your, all ten of your kids died. Job's having a bad day. Lost all of his animals. It's called the stock market crash. <laughs> all ten of his kids died. And the Lord said, or Job said, The Lord gave, the Lord took away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What kind of guy is this anyway? <laughs> Everybody else would get mad at God, right? Job lost it all. He said, Okay, God, it was yours to begin with. Thanks for letting me use it for a while. Then the devil gave him boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And if that wasn't bad enough, his wife turned against him. And Job said, Hey, you foolish woman, shall we not receive good at the hand of God and not evil? Job didn't sin with his lips in all of this. But then his four friends came to torment him, to comfort him, I mean. One of those guys was the shortest man mentioned in the Bible, Bildad the Shuhite. It's pretty short, folks, okay? These four guys came and they talked to Job for 35 chapters. Most of the book of Job is these guys telling Job why everything went wrong. They had to be Baptists, the way I got it figured. <laughs> That's what I am. <laughs> they said, Job, everything's going wrong, huh? Oh, we know why. You sinned. Now listen, folks. If something bad happens to somebody, you don't know why it happened. You should love them, pray for them, encourage them, and shut up. Don't go to the hospital when they get their gallstones taken out and say, Hey, brother, these aren't gallstones. These are tithes and offerings. God's getting them out of you one way or another. <laughs> Don't do that, okay? Let God take care of why everything's going on. He can handle that just fine. He doesn't need your help at all. So Job is sitting there scraping the pus out of the boil, sitting in the dust by the graves of his ten kids, wondering, what's going on? He said, I wish the Almighty would answer me. Lord, why is this happening to me? And folks, you don't have to live on planet Earth very long before you're going to be wondering why some things happen to you. If you haven't got there yet, you just keep living. It'll happen. Job didn't know about Romans 8, 28. It was coming, though. God said, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to His purpose. Now, this verse does not say everything that happens is good. 
it says everything will work together for good. It's a big difference. I'll show you. Has anybody here ever been hungry? You ever been hungry? Suppose you come to my house, you say, Brother Hovind, I'm hungry. I'll say, man, come on in, have a seat. I'll give you a cup of flour. <laughs> Ugh. I got it. Lean back, open up. We're going to shove in a spoonful of salt. Now that'll help you. How about a spoonful of baking soda? Oh, wow, that stuff tastes good. You're probably getting kind of dry by now. So lean back. We're going to pour down a half a cup of Crisco. <laughs> and chase it down with a cup of buttermilk. You say, that would taste terrible. How about if we mix them all together first and make biscuits? Hey, now you're talking. Did you know the individual ingredients for biscuits taste lousy? But they work together for biscuits, don't they? You know, God promised everything that happens to you will work together for good if you love God. Life is so simple. Keep your heart right with God. That'll be hard to do because the heart's deceitful and desperately wicked. But you just keep your heart right and everything that happens is good. Finally, though, in chapter 38, the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind. Boy, if a tornado starts talking to me, I'm going to pay attention. <laughs> and the Lord said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Hey, by the way, many false cults take a lot of their doctrine from the book of Job. One of Job's friends said something like, You know, the dead die and they don't know anything. Well, that's one of Job's friends saying that. It's true that they said that, but what they said was not true. Be real careful getting a doctrine from the book of Job. You know, read the verse and then say, Okay, that's interesting. Now, who said this? If it's one of Job's friends, it's true that they said it, but what they said may not be true. Just really be alert. Same thing in Ecclesiastes. That's the wisdom of man under the sun. It's not the wisdom of God above the sun. Okay? Just be real careful about getting your doctrine from those two books. Just take it very slow. God said, Who's darkening counsel by words without knowledge? God said, Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Man, I read that 34 years ago as a brand new Christian, and I thought, what a dumb question. Where were you when I built the earth? How many of you were here when God built the earth? Now, kids, this is going to be complicated. Okay, so listen carefully. Since you were not here when God built the earth, that means that God is older than you are. How many can figure this out with no help? Okay. Did it ever occur to you that God is also smarter than you are? Mm -hmm. Did it ever occur to you that God is stronger than you are? Mm -hmm. Did it ever occur to you that God is richer than you are? You say, Brother Hovind, everybody's richer than I are. <laughs> God certainly is. Try this one. Did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurred to God? Things occur to me all the time. I say, wow, I never thought of that before. Did you know that never happens to God? He has already thought of everything. He even knows the under and understands the imaginations of your thoughts and mine. This is a pretty cool verse. Not only does he know your thoughts, he knows the imaginations of the thoughts. That's a whole different level. You see, you can not only think about things, you can actually think about what you're thinking about. Think about that. <laughs> the Bible says God knows your thoughts and the Bible also says Jesus knows your thoughts. That's one of many verses that proves Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh. Not just a God like Jehovah's Witness say. He is the God in the flesh. God knows your thoughts. And get this. He loves you anyway. Wow. What a nice guy. God asked Job a question and Job did not answer. So God asked him another one. Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof if thou knowest? Question mark. Job doesn't answer. So God asked him another one. Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? Did you know scientists didn't even know there were springs in the sea until 1977? God asked Job this question. Probably Job was written shortly after the flood, right about in this time, when people are still living to be 400 years old. Because Job had 10 grown kids all die and lived long enough to see his fourth generation from the new batch of kids that he got. Probably lived right about in here. No mention of the law hadn't been given yet. Most people think Job was written probably the oldest book in the Bible, but not the first one in the Bible. God asked Job question after question. He said, where's the way where light dwelleth? That's a cool verse. Light doesn't stay in a place, it's in a way. 
But then it says, as for darkness, where is the place thereof? Hey, did you know darkness can't move? We're the children of light, right? The Bible says the gates of hell shall not prevail against... The gates don't move. People say, oh, hell's att Satan's attacking us. No, we're just not... We're not on the offense. It's our problem, okay? We're letting them win. We're the children of light. We're supposed to be on the move, folks. Anyway, by, God said, By what way is the light parted, which scattereth east wind upon the earth? Now, wait a minute. Does the light cause the wind? It sure does. Ask any weatherman. The sunlight causes the ground to warm up and the air to warm up and it causes it to expand the air and the wind is cut from the sunlight. God said that 4,000 years ago. God said, Canst thou send lightnings? Boy, it's a good thing I can't. <laughs> How many of you can think of somebody that's lucky to be alive because you can't send the lightnings? You can, I can think of several, yes, sir. God said, Can you send the lightnings that they may go and say unto thee, Here we are? Now, wait a minute. Is God telling Job electricity can be used to send a message? I believe he is, folks. That's how radio, TV, telephone, radar, microphones. Oh, yeah. God said that 4,000 years ago. God asked Job question after question after question. 84 questions by my count. Job never answered one. See, these are the kind of questions that don't need an answer. The question is designed to change the person's attitude. These are the same kind of questions you dads have to ask your kids. Say, I have three kids, one of each. Kids get to a certain age and they start to get kind of cocky and they think they should make the rules around the house. The kid comes in one day and says, Hey, Dad, listen, I believe I should be allowed to stay out till four in the morning with my friends. After all, I'm ten now. <laughs> Dad says, Hold on just a minute, kid. You'd like to know why you can't stay out till four in the morning. Well, son, let me ask you a couple questions here. Who pays the electric bill around this house? Who's paying for the house? Who paid for that bed you slept on last night? Who paid for those clothes you're wearing, son? Who pays for the food you eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat? Who paid for the hot water and soap you took a shower with about a month ago? <laughs> Let's just get it straight right now, son. The Bible is very clear on this topic. He who payeth the bills maketh the rules. Second Opinions, chapter 4. You see, son, me, dad, you, kid. And if you're going to sleep under my roof and eat my food, you're going to do it my way. And when you want to do it your way, well, then go get your own roof to sleep under and get your own food to eat, and you can do it your way. That's the golden rule, son. He that hath the gold maketh the rules. <laughs> Who do you think you are, kid? Where were you when we got this land and drove off to grizzly bears and walked uphill to school 40 miles in the snow, barefoot, both ways? I think God's asking Job these questions to change Job's attitude. We come to chapter 40, and God said, Behold now, behemoth. Now what on earth is a behemoth? Some reference Bibles say it could be the elephant or hippopotamus. No, it cannot be either of those. I think behemoth is the long-necked dinosaur, probably the brachiosaurus. Actually, there are 13 different long-necked dinosaurs. The Brachiosaur, the Cetosaur, the Mementosaur, the Seismosaur, the Suprasaur, the Apatosaur, the Blondosaur. <laughs> you just have to talk to her kind of slow, okay? Oh. <laughs> You'd be amazed how, how much hate mail I get from just that statement. It's an, I say, look, I'm blonde, my sister's blonde, my mother's blonde, my daughter's blonde, okay? I like blondes. And I like making fun of them, too. Okay, so back off. If you don't like it, edit this part of the tape out. All right? <laughs> he says, Behold now, behemoth eats grass as an ox. Now people say, hey, elephants eat grass. And my Bible says elephant. A lot of animals eat grass, okay? Look at the next verse. His strength is in his loins. His force is in the navel of his belly. The biggest part on him is his belly. They say elephants have a big belly. Yep, you're right. Hippos have a big belly. Brachiosaurus has a big belly. He has a big belly. <laughs> so does he. Mm -hmm. yeah. Next verse says, He moveth his tail like a cedar. Wait a minute. His tail's like a cedar tree? Have you ever seen an elephant's tail? <laughs> Not like a cedar tree. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen a hippo tail? Not like a cedar tree. 
You know, before they put those comments at the bottom of the Bible, they really should be required to read the passage at least once. You know, before they comment on it. <laughs> it's not an elephant hippo, hello. Uh, it's not one of those. Anyway, the Bible says, His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He had big bones. And they did. I've got one here on the table. This is a copy of a toe bone from a brachiosaur. Now, kids, this is going to be complicated, so listen carefully. The reason he had such big toe bones is because he had big toes. And he had those big toes because he had a big foot. Matter of fact, their foot was big enough to take a bath in, the footprint, if you're a little kid. Pictures on the back of the book uh, from Dinosaur Valley State Park right here. If you want to come by and take a look at that. They had that big foot because he had a big leg to hold up. His front leg is 20 feet tall. The biggest dinosaur found so far was found in Oklahoma, 60 feet to the top of the head. They say it'll take them 20 years to dig, dig all the bones out of the ground because it is a government project. <laughs> they say when it was alive, it might have weighed 100 tons. 100 tons is equal to 14 school buses put together. That means if he was to come by and step on you, you would be deeply impressed by him. He would be road pizza. <laughs> By the way, speaking of government projects, <clears throat> I want to show you folks my invention that's going to make me the richest man on planet Earth. I'm going to save so much money for the highway department, construction crews, and utility companies, and the military. And all I want is 10% of the savings. I'll be the richest man on planet Earth. I have invented a shovel that will stand up by itself. You won't need to pay those guys to lean on it anymore. Mm -hmm. You just watch when you drive by a construction crew. You'll see what I'm talking about. Everyone can use one of these inventions. Next verse says, He's the chief of the ways of God. He's the chief. That's the Hebrew word for chief, the Resheth. He's the biggest animal God ever made. Well, that would not be the elephant hippopotamus. It'd be the Brachiosaurus. And you know what kind of fits the pattern for the way the devil works? Whenever God makes things, the devil tries to destroy them. God invented beautiful things. God invented music. God loves music. And Satan has come along with some ungodly music you shouldn't listen to. Somebody asked me one time, they said, Brother Hovind, do you know what you get if you play country music backwards? I said, no. They said, you get your hound dog, your wife, and your pickup all back. <laughs> oh, yeah, back masking. I heard about that stuff. And God invented marriage and the family and sex. God made them male and female, and he understands it pretty good, and he put some rules down. Boys, don't touch the girls until you're married to them. Now, if you don't want to touch them, then stay away from me. Okay, I saw your kind out west. But, uh, uh, God wants you to have a wonderful life. He said the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. These movie stars getting married again every six months don't have a clue what the precious life is all about. Now, kids, listen carefully. Here's what you got to do. It doesn't matter what your friends are doing. The Bible teaches you're to keep yourself pure and your wife or husband keep, keep pure till you both walk down the aisle and the preacher says, wilt thou and you wilt. And then you stick with that one for the rest of your life. That's the precious life right there. God knows what he's talking about. The Bible says God created all the great creatures. God made the dinosaurs. And Satan said, you know, there has to be some way to use dinosaurs against God. But he couldn't fool Adam, not with dinosaurs. Imagine the devil walking up to Adam and saying, hey, Adam, did you know dinosaurs lived millions of years ago? Adam would say, are you dumb or what? There's one in the backyard eating off the cherry tree right now. <laughs> the devil couldn't fool Noah. He fed him every day. But for the next 4,000 years, they became pretty rare. Many species went totally extinct. Gone. And then in 1809, they found the bones and put one together. And the devil was there that day. He said, wow, here we go, folks. My chance, finally, after 4,000 years. Satan said, you know, these critters have always lived with man. I know that, and God knows that, but these people don't know that. So the devil said, I think I'm going to tell everybody they lived millions of years ago. And if they believe it, it'll make them doubt the Bible. And boy, has it worked good. You know, for the last 200 years, kids have been going to kindergarten and getting a book like this. I can read about dinosaurs. Would anybody like to just take a wild guess at what the first sentence in the book says? Millions of years ago. Yeah, sure enough. 
So many books in our libraries teach this stuff. Millions of years ago. How many kids are being taught that in your town at your expense? I go to museums all the time. just makes my blood boil, seeing all these beautiful, incredible museums, fancy displays, loads of money, and the wrong message. Kids are being brainwashed. That's why we started our own. We need lots of creation museums around the country, hundreds of them. You folks need one up here. Somebody start one. Next verse says, He lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fens. The word fens means the swamp. Well, the biggest swamp in the world is in the middle of Africa. Right there. Most Americans don't know how big Africa is. There's what America looks like next to the Africa. That swamp is gigantic. Bigger than the whole state of... Same size as the whole state of Illinois. Gigantic swamp. There have been reports of dinosaurs in that swamp in the last 200 years. There could be a few dinosaurs still alive. I don't think there's very many. I don't think they're very big ones. But I think there's some still alive, folks. We cover lots more on that in the next session. But basically, God made dinosaurs with Adam and Eve. They were big lizards before the flood. Noah took them on the ark. People began killing them. There are very, very few left today, but there might be a few still around. But don't let anybody tell you they lived millions of years ago. That is just plain baloney. We'll cover dinosaurs still alive in the next session after the break. Thank you.